Digimon, digital monsters. A line of digital pets created to be an extension of Tamagotchi, but marketed towards tiny little boys. So muscles and guns and motorcycles and innocent cats turning into scantily clad angels. Hmm. Like everything else at the time, Digimon was aiming high to be this giant multimedia franchise. An anime, video games, card games, comics, toys. No, Digimon did not start because of Pokemon, but Pokemon affected the entire toy industry, and the way Digimon expanded was in direct competition. Pokemon also helped to popularize the pet monster genre, where the first two Digimon anime played into this genre, creating its own unique world. The third series, Digimon Tamers, is a bit of a meta narrative taking place in the real world, where Digimon is a popular media franchise. So complete fantasy. I'd always watch the TV show. I used to play the card game. I even made up my own imaginary Digimon. Gamers is a response to all of these well-loved, popular, and remembered pet monster franchises. Every kid who grew up watching these kinds of shows wanted their own pet monster, and Digimon Tamers fulfills that fantasy. But it also uses a foundation created by Digimon to challenge the audience's expectations. Digimon Tamers is weird, it's dark, it promotes diversity, and its story and characters are a whole lot better than it has any business being. I revisited the original Digimon series, Digimon Adventure, over and over again over the years, but I really haven't done that with Tamers, so I'm able to look at the series without nostalgia goggles. But it's Digimon, so <laughs> I need my goggles. Tamers was written by Chia Chiaki... Chiaki... An anime writer who's best known for being dark and weird. Kanaka considers himself to be a Lovecraftian writer, so he's killing that late night Tumblr game. The storyline he contributed to Digimon Adventure 02 was tonally offbeat and creepy. Now make that 51 episodes! That's Kanaka. Tamers is known for its darker tone, but it's never depressing. It's still a hopeful story which uses the dark tones to increase the level of tension when needed and to play off the character's emotions. I like it when kids shows tastefully tackle dark and weird. Instead of violence and blood being used to creep audiences out, it's character actions and surreal imagery, yet it can be just as effective. By the end of Adventure 02, there were a total of 24 main characters, but Tamers takes a different approach. Including the Digimon, the core cast is six. The main goggle-wearing protagonist is Takato. Takato is a normal kid with normal emotions. He's scared when he meets Gilmon, a Digimon based on his own drawing for the first time. After all, it is a fire-breathing monster. Hi, Gilmon. <laughs> <laughs> Gilmon is newly created, so unlike every other Digimon in the series, it doesn't have this deep knowledge of the digital world. It's figuring out how other Digimon work just as Takato is. I'm Takato. Takato man? Uh, uh, I'm not a Digimon. Takato is very anxious, so dealing with the unpredictable childlike Gilmon creates a great chemistry. Henry, or Lee if you're watching the Japanese dub, is a non-violent, morally driven kid who doesn't even like to make Digimon fight in the video game. So he's a little dweeb. In the best way possible. Terriermon is Henry's partner. It's an excitable little rabbit Digimon who always wants to get into a fight. Henry the pacifist and Terriermon who turns into Gargamon. Wow. Side note, I love how the English dub makes all the gun sound effects, laser sound effects. What a simplistic solution to that problem. But like, uh, how do you censor something like this? Well, at least it's not Gundramon. It's not very smart to mouth off to someone bigger than you. Henry Momentai. Momentai. It means no worries for the rest of your days. Then there's Rika, or Ruki, if you're watching the Japanese dub. Rika is the Digimon queen. She's like really good at the Digimon card game. Because of that, everyone thinks she's cool. As I said, complete fantasy world. Rika is violent and sort of serves as a first antagonist for the series. She's always picking a fight. Hey! What a lousy fighter. But a fight's a fight. Renamon, Rika's Digimon, wants to be the strongest. So at first, they have less of a friendship and more of a working relationship. But eventually, they admit to caring about one another. Renamon is a fan favorite for reasons which can only be explored with safe search off. Y'all are nasty. 
One of the benefits to having a smaller cast is the Digimon are now their own characters with unique feelings, perspectives, and development. There's also more focus on side characters. We learn about Takato's friends, the villains, the families of the characters, and get some side character arcs which take the whole series to pay off. Other characters which later gain more importance include Kalamon, a silly light-hearted Digimon who holds the power to help other Digimon transform. Impmon, a sort of rude and pathetic Digimon who renounces his partners. Jerry, a quirky girl Takato has a crush on. Jerry is the only realistic character in this whole show. People like Jerry, but it's because she keeps her love of Digimon a secret. Just like me, from age 11 to 20. Put your beard on, you're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> Down here, not on me. Oh, sorry. Man, you're heavy. <laughs> Digimon Tamer's plot is a slow burn. The entire focus of the first third is how Digimon interact in the real world. However, to make this concept fresh, the Digimon now are less like little ugly people and more like, well, digital monsters. They're animalistic. It's in their programming to want to fight and human-like emotions are now learned rather than something Digimon are automatically equipped with. When Gilmon sees a threat, its eyes contract and its instinct kicks in. The kids have to learn with the Digimon and the Digimon have to adapt. This helps to contrast the dangerous fantasy monsters with the mundane town of Shinjuku, which features real world locations. Hiding Digimon has never really been a huge problem in the series because they've always been relatively small. But Gilmon is like a buff velociraptor. Takato can't just hide him inside, so a lot of the early episodes are dedicated to finding Gilmon a place to hide, which is complicated by Gilmon's desire to explore and play. Digimon transform into stronger, larger versions of themselves. This is called Digivolving. In past shows, Digivolving came quick and easy, happening very soon after the series started. And once it was done, Digimon had no problem turning back into their base form for the sake of convenience. It takes a while for Gilmon to finally Digivolve for the first time, and after it happens, he can't easily go back to normal. The next episode has Gilmon stuck as Growlmon, a giant T-Rex-sized Digimon. What follows is a series of attempts to get Gilmon to transform back to normal and find a place for this giant monster to hide. It's cute, it's funny, but also Takato has anxieties about losing Gilmon. It's a great balance and creates a problem out of something which was previously normal. Between the challenges the kids face just having their partners, they also have to defeat evil Digimon which appear in the real world. Takato and Henry are in the mindset the Digimon are living creatures, but Rika wants Renamon to kill them all and absorb their data to become more powerful. One of the things I don't like about Tamers is how they handle the enemy Digimon. This layer of fog automatically forms which blocks the outside world from seeing what's going on. In Tamers, so much of the focus is Digimon interacting with the real world. It would be much more interesting for the characters to have to try to hide what's going on while the Digimon are fighting each other. It would also make the worries of the government organization Hypnos much more meaningful if we see the damage Digimon are causing. Digimon is known for its action sequences being interrupted by long transformation scenes, but now there are Digimodifying sequences. The kids use cards from the official Digimon card game to give their Digimon extra powers, and for just $4.99 a pack, so can you. Sometimes it's cool and sometimes it's funny watching little old Terriermon with a giant hammer. I like the concept of Digimodify, but they play it off as if the kids are using a strategy when it really feels like they're just throwing down modifications until something works. If the rules of the game were explained, it'd be more interesting to watch the kids develop the strategy with the cards. It does work to make them more involved, but it doesn't really invite us into their thought process. With Digimodifying, Digivolving as a means of victory is downplayed. For one, it's not always accessible. Usually, Kalamon has to be present, and eventually a special card has to appear to activate the next stage. When it does happen, the sequences are crazy cool. When they're animated in 2D. Matrix Digivolution. There's this whole black and green Matrix vibe to them, which really helps to sell that digital aesthetic. Tamers tells one story with a beginning, middle, and an end, which is why it feels like such a slow burn. By episode 12 of Digimon Adventure, the first story arc had completed, but Tamers is barely getting started by episode 12. First time viewing, the show may feel like it's dragging, but I watched the first half a second time for this video, and I have to say it's a lot better on a repeat viewing. 
The show does feel like it's sort of starting this simple story arc when 12 Digimon based on the Chinese Zodiac start attacking Shinjuku. Each episode has the kids beating one of the 12, Deva. So you think it's going to be this clean boss battle style arc where they beat one every episode, but then everything changes course when Kalamon is captured and brought to the digital world. It sets up a simple, predictable storyline just for the purpose of changing course. That's great. Even when they finally arrive into the digital world, it's nothing like the way it was in Adventure. Instead of the Narnia-style fantasy world, it's this desolate wasteland filled with scraps of data trying to form into something more meaningful. It's specifically withholding the familiar, but if you're part of the Japanese audience, eventually someone familiar does come along. Ryo. Oh yeah. Yay, uh, who? Ryo was supposed to be this familiar face for Digimon fans. A character whose back of the head made a two-second non-speaking cameo in Adventure Zero 2. And he was the main character in some Japan-exclusive games for everyone's favorite console, the Wonder Swan. Good old Ryo. On the good old Wonder Swan. If you didn't have a Wonder Swan growing up, did you even have a childhood? Reading through Kanaka's notes, which I highly recommend to any fan, it seems like the role Ryo plays may have been considered for one of the characters from Adventure. But I guess from a story standpoint, it makes more sense to use Ryo as a connection, as we learn Ryo is from the Tamers universe. But it doesn't provide that feeling of familiarity it's supposed to for American audience. And if you've seen any of my videos, you know the way I mispronounce words means I'm very American. Hey, before we continue with the video, I wanted to give a quick shout out to my patrons who claimed the shout out reward tier on my Patreon. So special thanks to those who contributed it in the month of June, including the new ones, Child Noodle, Steve Malnick, Michael, that guy in the store, and finally, Ryan Smith, aka Vexed Fox. So thank you to them and all of my returning patrons. My Patreon exclusive review for the month of June will be going up in a few days. And at the end of July, I will be posting an exclusive review for Digimon Tamers Battle of Adventures, the first Digimon Tamers movie. So like all of my other reviews, I'm watching the English dub. I do that because it's what I grew up with. Sure, it's a different product than the Japanese dub, but it's the one I want to talk about because it's what I have a connection to. But Tamer's dub is more respectful to the source material than the other two are. It's worth noting Tamer's dub wasn't handled by the same team, and often it's actually Steve Bloom of sexy voice fame writing the dub. He also plays Blonde Spike Spiegel and Gilmon. That's right, the same guy who did this. I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. <laughs> also does this. Play now. <laughs> I wish I could. The theme song is still the same from the previous shows, but it's remixed with this like, grittier electric guitar. I really love the casting in the English dub, except for Susie. They're so pink and pretty. <laughs> One of my biggest pet peeves are the way that English dubs handle little kids. I can't stand it. Hello? Hello? How dare you? I particularly like David Wittenberg as Henry and Bridget Hoffman as Jerry. There is a realism to their performance. It's imperfect. One of my biggest problems with the dub, however, is actually the music. In the first half of the series, they reuse a lot of the music from the English dub of the Digimon Adventure series. It's more fantastical and does a disservice to Tamer's attempts to establish this as a different world. But at least Digimon Tamer's doesn't have the Digi-Rap. The digi the series is all about perspective and change. All of the main characters have different philosophies which drive them, but they grow with time. Every time a new villain is introduced, we learn they're not really the villain. One of the benefits of having a smaller cast is the focus on side character development, specifically Impmon and Jerry, whose stories kind of coincide with one another. A big change which is made is a downplay on destiny. The kids in Adventure were chosen to be partnered with their Digimon, but in Tamers, the Digimon and the human have to agree to be partnered. There's more of an effort to make the kids involved in the fight, and this idea of kids and Digimon choosing to work together pays off with the Digimon's final evolution, bio-merging. Takato, Rika, Henry, and good old Ryo all combine with their Digimon to become super strong. 
As a kid, I hated this, but as an adult, I love this. I understand what they're going for now. Focusing on the partnership as a two-way relationship makes the relationship more meaningful. These characters weren't chosen for one another, they picked each other. However, that also makes it possible for Digimon to renounce their tamer and makes it even more brutally heartbreaking when one of the Digimon dies. Impmon can't Digivolve because it abandoned its tamers. Two little brat kids. But Ipmon makes a deal with the leader of the Deva. Uh, Zu... 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 Quia... Z... Z... Moltres? It'll help him digivolve if he destroys the kids. This isn't a threat which was suddenly introduced like many of the villains in Adventure. This is a character we saw develop and get desperate enough to come to this point. We also see Jerry want to become partners to Leomon and how much the partnership means to her when it finally agrees. That's why it's so effective when Impmon, as Beelzemon, kills Leomon and absorbs its data. Impmon's character arc continues when it later reconnects with its tamers and becomes desperate to earn Jerry's forgiveness, leading up to one of the most emotionally resonant moments in the entire franchise. In an act of desperateness, Beelzemon calls upon Leomon's data and uses the Fist of the Beast King, Leomon's signature attack. Tamer's dark tone really expresses itself within the final third of the series. After Jerry loses Leomon, her body becomes possessed by something called the D-Reaper. We get a nightmare from her and her emotionless body inhabited by this emotionless being is just unsettling. The scene that got under my skin specifically was Jerry attacking her little brother. Something about little kids being violent just... Ugh. The final villain isn't a Digimon. The D-Reaper was a program created to clean up scrap data and AI files which were too large. It was created by the team who created Digimon as a sort of cleaning software. All the villains are good guys in their own eyes, but the D-Reaper has no philosophy. It's just cleaning up a mess which happens to be, you know, life. The forms it takes are just so unsettling and it uses Jerry's voice to communicate which is also just, it, it gets under your skin. The ending of Tamers gives no time for celebration. It's sudden and it's more bitter than sweet, but it leaves the audience with a small glimmer of hope that the kids may one day see the Digimon again. Tamers is something truly unique. It creates something that is great and genuinely creative out of a franchise which is really just meant to sell toys. And I think that's why people love it so much. It's not a toy commercial. I mean, how do you sell this? It's a sincere and emotionally grounded story using the desires of kids to create a well-meaning fantasy. With the 15th anniversary Blu-ray of Digimon Tamers, there was a special audio drama CD which featured all of the characters in 2018 and ended on a cliffhanger. Kanaka has expressed interest on a proper return to the Tamers world, but of course I love the series and I would be open to it. However, after watching Digimon try, I uh... I really don't want to see where Digimon would bring Renamon. Y'all are nasty. Thank you for watching this video. If this is your first video of mine, please be sure to follow me on social media, hit that notification button and subscribe. I know it's obnoxious when YouTubers do this, but YouTube really does make it harder for subscribers to see content makers videos and they're making it harder all the time. I'm so happy all these Digimon videos are doing well. I'm already working on my next one to be posted in a few weeks. So stay tuned for that. Other than that, thank you for watching. Have a good day and I'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.